Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak freak. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Tokyo, Japan is ultra fast, ultra modern, and completely 21st century. Japan with a grande triple latte. The amount of neon and activity. It's an overwhelming dose of things Japanese, but also some things familiar. Coca-Cola in the morning. That's the breakfast of champions. I'm a New Yorker. I'm very aware of the fact that I'm someplace else when I'm not in New York City. Yet Tokyo somehow still seems to make sense to me. It's a modern, urban experience. I wanted to explore elements of Japanese cuisine more alien to the Western palate. I thought it was a very good idea to get out of Tokyo. It was something I hadn't done before. We're going from Utami to uh, Ryokan, traditional country inn with onsen, hot springs, for um, kaiseki, which is, uh, Again, a very old and refined style of dining. We're taking the bullet train, I believe, Shinkansen. So we're going to take a very fast train to a very slow place. Looks like the space shuttle, doesn't it? I love the, uh, the compacted uh, insect life on the front. I think that gives you an idea of how fast this thing moves. I'm a little intimidated, I have to say. It's very formal. This is about as far away from, you know, the urban experience as uh, one could, as, as I could imagine. And I'm hungry, I could go for a bento box. Prepare for liftoff. This is a little bento box. It's what I just bought on the train. And the nice lady who came along in the uniform. In this case, I'm having a little unagi, that's eel, sticky rice, and some pickles. And there's a nice little container here. Bento, boxed meals like this one are very popular in Japan. Sort of like brown bag lunch meets fast food. Only instead of a Big Mac or PB&J, you get rice and fish. We should have this in America. The scenery whips by my window at 150 miles per hour. That's fast food. Just feel that blast of air from the other train that passed. It's incredible. 55 minutes later, having whipped through rural Japan, past Mount Fuji, glimpses of the ocean, we find ourselves in a mountainous seaside resort town, popular for its many ryokan with hot springs. My first thought driving through the pass was that the bullet train must have gone so fast it broke the time-space barrier. How do you get yourself as far away from the workaday bustle of Tokyo as you can? You go back to the 15th, 16th century. From the minute I set foot in the Ryokan, I feel like a Japanese feudal lord. She's off, I'm guessing. I'm definitely being treated like one. This Ryokan is no Motel 6. It's basically an exclusive getaway for affluent Japanese. With humility befitting a Japanese emperor, I'm served a small snack, a candy date, and hot green tea. Like this, yes? Yes. 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 Yes.
We are living large, man. This is, you know, I'm, I'm reliving every Kurosawa film I've ever seen right now. It's a very cinematic experience, particularly if you're a samurai buff like I am. You really feel like you're in another time completely. You might as well be in 16th century Japan. This Ryokan in particular offers kaseki cuisine, which is a cuisine dating back many hundreds of years. It is viewed by most as the most refined style of Japanese cuisine. It grew up around the tea ceremony, which is incredibly elaborate and seen as the apex of grace and sophistication. Using almost exclusively ingredients from the local hills and water, the kitchen staff has been busy for hours. Everything has to be immaculately cleaned and prepared long before any cooking begins. This isn't the style of cooking as much as it is a discipline. But before I can nose around in the kitchen, it is strongly recommended that I go take a soak in the hot springs. In Kaseki cuisine, the food is inseparable from the environment. That's very much part of the meal. One has to be relaxed, with senses fully primed to appreciate it, as so goes the thinking here. So as my food is being prepared for me, I'm being prepared for my food. When they're not working in Japan, they give a lot of thought to how best to relax and enjoy. Ryokan is the boiled down wisdom of generations of thinking about how best to relax. And who am I to disagree? When evening comes, a zen-like stillness settles over the whole mountain. It's dinner hour. Now, supposedly other guests are being served somewhere. I haven't seen any of them. In my tatami room, for all intents and purposes, I'm the center of the universe. I'm about to have a tr tremendous meal and be entertained. This is about the most formal experience you can have. The possibilities for rudeness and looking silly are enormous. Most of us are reasonably familiar with a formal meal. the way one behaves at the table, the way one dresses, the way we handle knives and forks. That's good. But here, the etiquette is even more rigorous. So you know, for a clumsy New Yorker, completely ignorant, it can be pretty damn intimidating. Fortunately, I have help. Two experienced and talented geishas to help navigate me through the meal and entertain. Believe me, I need all the help I can get. It's like the beginning of 2001 where, where they throw the bone in the air. That's how I feel. You're like an ape. Learning to walk erect. Geishas are basically professional hostesses. They are not call girls like many Americans think. <laughs> They're women who have dedicated their lives to the traditional Japanese arts. This is highbrow service. So good. A little sake, and I'm ready. First up is the kaiseki equivalent of a sampler plate. There's dried mullet eggs with radish. Wonderful texture. Oyster cooked in soy sauce. We have nothing like it. Smoked trout with lotus root. It's, it's a, a, like discovering a, a, you know, a, a new planet, a new world and sea cucumber seasoned with its own liver. So I'm afraid to eat it, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's like a Thomas Keller dish. Oh, wow. This is so good. I'm told the next dish contains fish liver, that pasty lump you see in the center. I jump right in to everyone's embarrassment. The proprietor who's sitting in the wings is mortified. Mix, mix. Mm. OK, a little bit in? No, no, no. No, just It turns out this is like getting an order of fries and just eating the ketchup. Uh, 
You're supposed to dip the fish fillets into the liver. Okay. <laughs> the dishes get increasingly exotic, like slightly grilled squid or soft shell turtle soup. The centerpiece of the meal arrives grilled local lobster. Trying to tunnel that out of this shell is going to be very, very difficult. Oh, look at this. I don't think I'll be able to. Oh, look at this. I will definitely need help here. I am. Okay. All right, this is Mount Everest. My chopstick skills are not that good. The geishas, once again, come to my aid. You know, one of the many things we make fun of when customers ask for it, the lazy lobster. You're so stupid and so inept, you can't even pull meat out of a lobster shell. I can't, not with chopsticks. <laughs> Any great cuisine grew up around the idea of using what's local. You know, American culinary traditions uh, have been to make the food the same in New York as it is in Los Angeles. And that's hurt us, I think. You know, we have a lot of good food, but we're afraid to show uh, local pride. That's what this is. You know, this is something from the neighborhood. You know, they're very proud of it. This is very New England. Mm. Oh, wow. Spectacular. As I finish off my meal with a soup of fresh local mushrooms and miso broth, the geishas treat me to a private musical performance. Dinner at the Ryokan. I've been just completely seduced into the entire experience. Another couple of days in this place, and I'd start spouting New Age psycho babble and talk about sitting on top of a mountain contemplating a tangerine for the rest of my life. Breakfast is another matter. This is not bacon and eggs over easy. Now, I don't know what the hell this is. What are these? Is this is seafood? There's some sort of little sea worms or something on it, and what I believe is mountain potato dumpling underneath. Now my tongue is sending out violent alarm bells. Um, this is natto, and it's uh, like a fermented bean. This is a really frightening texture. I mean, it's mucilaginous. This is like eating out of a spit cup at the dentist. And it takes every bit of strength and grit I've got not to let my face show it. Yeah, I'm, I'm speechless, it's so good. Despite breakfast, I leave the Ryokan more relaxed and Perry Como on tranquilizers. Now I was ready for some cuisine with an edge, something dangerous. Thank you very much. We're on the road back from Atami to Tokyo, and we pull over to make a pit stop. You know, a little bathroom break, pick up a few snacks. Ah, the Great American Truck Stop, I feel right at home. This is not the Vince Lombardi Service Center on the New Jersey Turnpike. It's a vending machine paradise. The Japanese love building complex machines for simple tasks. A cup of Acapulco, a cup of Tom and Jerry. What to do, what to do, it all looks so good. I decide to start with a ticket machine. We'll spit out a ticket that you can then bring to a counter and get a nice bowl of udon or soba. Plain udon, udon with uh, dried fish. That's noodles for you bridge and tunnelers. Mmm, that wet my appetite. Okay. Decisions, decisions. Fries, the dog, uh, the other thing. I think the fries, the safe bet. Is there a fryer later in there? That's what I want to know. It's a tiny little basket. You want fries with that, sir? How do I open this? It doesn't open this way. Your fries are up, sir. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, man, this may co could cause serious injury. It's like hot steam going in there. 
Mmm, soggy. Let's see for dessert. Nothing hits a spot like marble cheesecake ice cream cup. The Japanese love convenience, and they love machines. Sounds ominous. It's like a body being dropped from a great height. There's almost nothing that can't be done by a vending machine, apparently. Mmm, cheesy. I don't know how far away a dentistry machine is. Maybe a little coffee with dessert. But I foresee that in the very near future. Emerald Mountain Blend, Mocha Kilimanjaro, Mocha Chino, Frappuccino, Al Pacino. Starbucks is in real trouble. Cappuccino y. That night in my hotel room back in Tokyo, I'm having trouble sleeping. I've been thinking about the deadly and dreaded fugu fish. Known to us as blowfish or puffer fish because it can blow itself up like a big balloon, its trump card is a highly lethal poison. So naturally, the Japanese consider it a delicacy. If fugu is properly prepared by a licensed chef, it is supposed to be completely safe. Yet every year, at least 10 fatalities are attributed to this delicacy. I've told all my friends in New York, I'm going to eat fugu. I've told my wife I'm going to eat fugu. Now that it was time for my appointment with Destiny, I'm having second thoughts. This is the stuff of legends. You eat fugu, you turn colors, go numb, pitch over on your face on the table, and it's all over. But for me, it's kind of like climbing culinary Everest. It's an obstacle to be surmounted. If people are willing to risk death, it must taste phenomenal. And I'm guessing that if maybe you have a little bit of the poison, you might get a nice buzz. Fugu has a limited season, and this is it. That's how I find myself at Nabiki Restaurant in Tokyo. Inside Nabiki Fugu Restaurant, I find myself face to face with Mr. Yoshida. Hi. I'm not sure yet if he's my chef or the Grim Reaper, but he definitely holds my life in his hands. The danger of fugu comes in its preparation. One must be licensed, extensively trained, and handle it in certain ways as prescribed by law. It's a fairly complicated business to tell which parts are toxic and which parts safe. And there's apparently no telling how much of this toxic substance is present in any particular fish. Every edible ounce must be washed obsessively to make sure it doesn't contain a single micron of poison. Once ingested, there is no antidote. It's been explained that uh, the, the discarded organs must be placed under lock and key, sent back to Tsukiji Market, and disposed of there so that there is no possibility of this potentially dangerous material being misused or lost. As I sit down at the table, Mr. Yoshida assures me as long as the fish is handled and prepared correctly, there's next to no risk. Notice that's next to no risk. The chef has just informed me that if you do start feeling a numbness in your extremities, uh, <laughs> you're in trouble. If this is such a delicacy, where is everybody? I feel like the victim of some gruesome joke. Before I can slip out the back door, the meal begins. This is the uh, fugu sashimi. Thin slices of raw fugu served with soy sauce, chives, and ground radish with red pepper for dipping. Really good. I can do this. Next up is fugu, nabe style. A simmering soup of fugu, tofu, mushrooms, and cabbage made in a pot right at your table. Mmm. It's wonderful. It's very subtle. I finish off the meal with batter fried fugu, not unlike Arthur Treacher or fish and chips. I could eat this regularly. There's nothing here that's going to really weigh you down. Here, the whole idea is you don't want to distract from the taste of the, the fugu. Extraordinarily subtle tasting fish. OK, so fugu actually tastes rather bland. I guess the thrill of eating fugu is all in the risk. I mean, this is a great cocktail party story. Yeah, yeah, I ate the poisonous blowfish, and I survived. So I was a little disappointed. I was kind of looking for a buzz, frankly, and maybe a little numbness around the lips. Once again, I've been laboring under many misconceptions. You know, a Fugu story, uh, I guess it's the Japanese version of the urban legend. 
you know, people talk about it in New York uh, as, if, as if it were something very different than, than what it is. Like with most things in Japan, the terror factor is really overrated. I mean, yeah, the cuisine of Japan is different. There's no two ways about it. But food's like art. I mean, just because we're not Italian, it doesn't mean we can't appreciate Michelangelo. It's the same thing with food. Yet another in one of many remarkable experiences in this incredible town. Someday, in around, in around 10 years of constant practice, I think I will be a suitable dinner companion in, in, in Japan. Until that time, I'll have to bumble clumsily through one terrific experience after another.